Welcome. We appreciate you joining with us to watch this message. We pray it will bless you, that we'll all learn, grow, and become more like Jesus. Let's join in in watching the message at this time. Pastor Vic Pence told the following story, and I assume that it's about himself. He went to Nordstrom's and bought a blue blazer, took it home, wore it a couple times, and decided, man, this thing is really no good at all. He didn't like the color. It collected lint. It was, it was just a pain. So for the next six months, he kept wearing it reluctantly until finally he gave up when he said, this is it. I'm hanging it in the closet. Forget about it. Now, what you have to understand is Nordstrom's has this warranty, this guarantee, unconditionally guarantee. If you don't like it, you can return it. No questions asked. Doesn't matter when, just return it. So he hung this blue blazer that he hated in the closet all the time knowing, you know, I could take it back to Nordstrom's and get, get a new one, get one that I liked. And it finally ate at him enough that after a year and a half of owning this blue blazer, he decided, I'm going to take it back. So he, he got it out of the closet, said he actually threw more lint on it, made sure it was really fussed up bad, and went back to Nordstrom's, walking through the door thinking, I'm, I'm going to scam them on this. I, I'm feeling guilty. I'm a pastor, and I'm going to scam them. So he had his little speech all prepared, walked up to the first salesman that he came up to, which was a, a dude with a handlebar mustache, so it looked a little bit macho, and so he walked up, and I quote, I am about to put your famous unconditional return policy to its ultimate test. I have here a blazer. I've worn it lots. I've had it for a year and a half. I don't like it. It's the wrong color, and it attracts lint like it's going out of style. But I want to return this for another blazer that I like. End quote. And he just stood there. And this handlebar mustache salesman just stood there. Finally, the salesman said, and I quote, For heaven's sake, what took you so long? Let's go find you a blazer, end quote. Ten minutes later, Pastor Vic Pence walked out of Nordstrom's with a brand new blazer worth $75 more than he paid for the original and didn't cost him a penny. A year and a half wasted with this blazer that he didn't like. Well, welcome to Father's Day message today. And I hope that all of you guys have a great day today. Now, hopefully you treated your wives really special for her day. So now that she's going to pay you back for your day. And hopefully it's a good payback. So I hope, hope that you all have a good day anyway. So we're going through the Bible with the epic journey, and we're in Genesis. We've already been through the beginning, so now we're in Abram's, Abraham's journey of faith, which we're looking at some of the highlights of his life. And today we're looking at a quote, don't know if God actually said this or not, but trust me. Like I said, don't know if that's actually in the Bible or not, but just, just imagine that it is, that God is looking at you and saying, trust me. Now remember, at this point in his life, it's still Abram and not Abraham. So if I goof, I apologize. When God makes you a promise, and he's made lots of them in the Bible, do you trust him? Do you believe him? Now it's easy for us to sit here today and say, well, of course I do. But do your words that you say prove that you trust him? Do your actions prove that you trust him? Or are you complaining at God a lot of times? Are you worrying a lot of times? Yeah. Do, you, do we really, really believe God when he says it? So let's put this to the test. In the Old Testament, which is where we're at now, the Israelites are on the east side of the Jordan, ready to enter into the promised land. Now, this is the land that God is promising to Abram that we read about now. So they're ready to go into the promised land to conquer it. But we got to go back a few years, 40 years. They were going to enter the promised land at that point too, led by Moses. 
And they sent the spies in, and the spies came back, 10 of the 12 said, no way. They're giants. We're grasshoppers. They're going to chew us up and spit us out. They're going to stomp on us. No way. And God said, fine, wander in the wilderness for the next 40 years till all of you 20 years and old die off. Oh, no, we're going to go in, we're going to defeat them. And they went in to Canaan, and they were beaten because God wasn't with them. So, so now you're a soldier ready to go in. Now, at this point, Moses is still alive. Let's see what Moses has to say. Deuteronomy 31, 6. Moses knows what there is in their mind. He says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you, nor forsake you. So now, you're a soldier. You know the history, just 40 years ago. Maybe it was your dad, maybe your grandpa that experienced that. You know that Israel was defeated at that time. You're a soldier, ready to go in. Do you really believe God's promise? He will never leave you nor forsake you. You're the spouse of this soldier. He's going into battle. Do you believe he's coming home alive? It's your son. Do you believe he's coming home alive? It's your daddy. We put ourselves in this situation, and all at once, how well did they trust God? How would how well would we trust God? You say, well, that's Old Testament. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not modern. Okay, let's go to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be confident with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Okay. You're sick. You don't know what's wrong. They need to go in and do an exploratory surgery. Do you trust God? You and your child, your son or daughter, you've just had a terrible argument. They're teenagers. And the argument was really hot. They run out of the house like, I hate you! Slam the door, jump in the car and take off. Do you trust God to take care of that child of yours? See, when the rubber meets the road, it gets difficult. Let's go to another one. New Testament, words of Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 27. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. How's that peace of God working for you? Your spouse is really, really sick. He or she is going in for surgery. Are you at peace? Are you really hurting? 2 a.m. in the morning. You just lost your job yesterday. Bills are coming due. You've already missed one or two payments, and what happens next with the house payment or the car payment? See, these are tough. And don't get me wrong, I am not pointing at anyone. I am not throwing stones because this affects every last one of us. Dads, you've been there if you're old enough. The worries, the problems... Moms, you've been there. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, you've been there. We've all faced it. And this is life. This is, this is what it is. And there's something about pain or something about you think God has left you down at another time that makes it harder to believe this time that you can trust God. Today we're going to see that Abram and us are a lot alike. Abram was going through a time where he didn't know how much he trusted God. Just the same way that you and I go through times that we don't know 
God promised Abram, I'm going to make you into a great nation. That means he's got to have a son. Him and Sarai are getting older. How much longer can they bear children? How much longer can, will Sarah be able to conceive? She's, she's going to be past, or maybe already past childbearing years. See the problems that he's got in his mind? So when we go back to the opening illustration, Nordstrom's in that illustration is God. Pastor Pence is us. He didn't trust Nordstrom's. Sometimes no better than we trust God. And this is what we find Abram in. Not trusting God. We're going to read... Genesis chapter 15. We're going to start with verse 1. And I want us to notice something here. Before, it's been God talking, monologue. God telling Abram, I'm going to make you into a great nation. You're going to have uh, multiple generations. You're going to, be, going to be a great nation. A lot of people. This time, it's different. It's a dialogue. And it's almost as though Abram is just waiting for God to come back and make this promise again, because I want you to notice he seems frustrated. God isn't even going to talk about a nation or a generation, but Abram's going to bring it up. Let's go to chapter 15, verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. Now notice, Abram's right there. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Now, God has promised him to have children, to have Great generations become a great nation, but it's not happening. So this culture at that time says, well, if there's no children, then one of your servants will inherit everything. Now remember, he's rich. Abram is very rich, got a lot of herds, a lot of, a lot of money. And so uh, Eliezer might be kind of excited at this point right now. I, I don't know. And so Abram brings this up. Well, wait a minute. What about this promise of a nation? What about this promise of a son? What's, what's happening with this? And see, this is much like us in life. We have things hit us in life, and, and we, we get concerned. Sometimes we suffer for no apparent reason. Sometimes it's not our fault. Sometimes we made the mistake. Sometimes we've sinned and, and we repent. We go to God and say, okay, show up. You know, help me out here. I've repented. Sometimes it just seems that life is squeezing the breath out of us. Sometimes it's as though no, nothing major went wrong, but just everything is just caving in on us, closing in on us, and it's hard to breathe. It's hard to see God. So when God showed up with this greeting, Abram was ready to pounce on it. What, what about this promise, God? God seems not to care to Abram. Verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed God and credited to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So now God gives Abram an object lesson. He says, go outside. Look up at the stars. Now, put yourself in his place. It's, it's not like here in Lima where we have a hard time seeing the stars simply because uh, there's too many city lights, pollution. And that day there was no pollution. Probably a moonless night. 
bright stars. Can you just imagine seeing what Abram looked at? And God says, look up at the sky and count the stars. There would have been gazillions of them. So much you couldn't count, if indeed you could count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Isn't that beautiful? Kind of poetic? Definitely prophetic. God says you can't count those stars. That's your offspring. That's an example of your offspring. Well, that should reassure Abram, right? No way. Abram's had enough of this. I don't know if he, I don't think he shook his fist. Prove it! I think he was very, very humble at this point. He said, prove it, God. Show me something. I need some hope. Haven't you been there? I have. The life is squeezed out of you. God, I need something to grasp onto. Verse 9. So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. I'm told that 100, 200 years ago, that if two farmers were going to make a deal, maybe buy some ground off the other or sell a bull, buy a heifer, whatever it might be, they'd simply shake their hands on the deal. And that was the contract. It worked. Well, now we've got to have a legal contract signed. It's got to be done by a lawyer. It's got to have all the T's crossed, the I's dotted uh, to make it binding. Well, let's go back several thousand years. This was their way of doing a contract. They took the animals, they split them in half right down the middle, laid half over here and half over here. Now, this is just getting good, so hang with me here. We go to verse 12. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. Now, this is God telling him what's going to happen with the they're going to be in Egypt, they're going to be enslaved, and then Moses is going to lead them out. So we, we got the story here. Let's go on to the next verse. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants, I give this land. Now, this is the ancient tradition of the covenant that we started talking about just a bit ago. The pieces are split in half down the middle. They're laid on each side. And when two people or two parties would agree on something, then each person or each party would walk between these split animals. Now, you can just imagine, it's kind of gross to think about it, but it, it'd probably be blood running down into the middle. So as they walk through with their sandals or their bare feet, they're, they're getting blood on them. But this was a covenant. This was the promise. This was the guarantee. Whatever was agreed upon, this sealed it. But notice, only one of them walked through it. This, what, what, what was it? A smoking fire pot with a blazing torch. That was God. God walked through this, but not Abram. Why? Now, I'm not certain that I have the answer. I, we're just guessing here at this point. Maybe God was the only one that needed to walk through it. It's God making the covenant, God making the promise, so maybe God was the only one that needed to go through it. I, I don't know. There's another possibility, though. You ever make a promise to God and didn't keep it? Did we just kind of slough it off? Let's go back to Abram's time. These were binding covenants. If Abram walked through that, that meant that Abram had to keep his end of the deal. And he knew he couldn't do it. 
Impossible. He's human, like you and me. We can't do it. And he knew it. So we don't know for certain what reason, why he didn't go through, but he, he didn't. Concerning God's part of the promise, though, one point today. God is faithful and will never break his promises. Never. God will never break his promises. And we can trust him completely and wholly. But see, the problem is not with God in these covenant arrangements. It's us. We're the ones that don't live up to it. Now, I, I don't use movies for an illustration very much, but this, this one movie just seems to be the best illustration of who we are and what we're like. <clears throat> Movies from the 60s or the 70s, I don't know. The star of the movie had had a rough life, and he, he's, he's fed up with it. So he's on a beach. He wades out into the ocean and decides he's going to end his life. So he starts swimming away from the beach, complaining to God about life. And I don't remember what it was even about, except, you know, God, I've lost my business. My, my partner stole it from me. My wife has left me. My kids have left me. You know, just, just bemoaning everything. It's just every reason he could think of to end his life. And you could see each, each stroke that he's swimming, he's farther from shore until finally he is way out there, way out there. Until so finally he decides, maybe I want to live after all. So he turns around, and shore is so far away. How do you ever get back? So he starts praying to God. Hey, God, you know, if you just get me back, I'll give you, I'll give you half of everything that I own. My, my paycheck from now, I'll give you three quarters of it. God, I'll go to church every Sunday. I'm going to, my, my kids, I'm going, to, I'm going to treat them better. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And so he makes all these promises, except as he gets closer to shore. And now with his, is within reach. He starts reneging on his promises. But you know, God, I can't quite give you half of everything that I own because I've got some debts to pay. Um, I'll give you 25%. A little while later, you, well, you know, God, the Bible says you only demand 10%. We'll, we'll go down to 10%. He goes down a little bit farther. You know, God, you know, I've really got this debt I've got to pay. And God, I promised my kid I would be at his softball game, but I, I promised my buddies I was going to go golfing with him. You see what I'm getting at? And by the time that he finally clawed his way up onto the beach, he had reneged on every promise to God. Now, does that ring a bell? Have you ever been so sick or, or a family member so sick? God, if you just heal me or heal them, I promise. And when God gets you through it, what happened to our promise? See, the problem is not with God. The problem is with us. We fail to keep our part of the bargain. God has never failed. To keep his promises. He's never broken a one, never will. How do we know? Well, we've got the history of the Bible, but we've also got a, a new covenant. God gave the most precious thing that he had to let us know he's going to keep his promise. He gave his son, Jesus Christ. Perfect, unblemished lamb died on the cross for your sins and my sins. And that's our guarantee God is not going to renege on his promise. There's a proverb in the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. See, our, our understanding is we, we can't figure God out. We don't think like him. His ways are not our ways. Our ways are not his ways. And even though it seems like we're suffering more than we need to, God is teaching us, teaching us faith, teaching us strength. Same way that 
we dads sometimes have our kids to go through some hard times so that they build up strength and stamina and they can understand things better. Abraham later finally learned to trust God. It took a long time. And we're going to go through another week or so here of him not really doing very well at trusting God. But eventually he learns to trust God. Trust is tough. On December of 2016, Knott's Berry Farm, California, one of their amusement park rides malfunctioned. 20 passengers were stranded 148 feet in the air. That's a long way up. They called the fire department, and fire captain Larry Kurtz assured them that the fire team will get them down. Since no ladder would reach them, they were going to use a rope. He said, rest assured, this rope has a 9,000-pound strength to it. It's, it's going to be safe. Well, you know what? If I'm on the ground and my family member, relative, friend, or whatever's up on that ride, and I'm on the cell phone with them, I'm going to assure them, it's okay. The fire department knows what they're doing. They'll get you down. The rope is strong. It's going to be okay. But you know what? You put me up there, 140 feet in the air, I'm terrified of heights. I will not trust those fire. I will not trust that rope. See, it's different when we're in the position. We're in here this morning where it's safe. Of course we trust God. We would never break our trust of God. But walk through that door and get in life situations. And all at once, we don't trust God as we say we would. All 20 passengers got down safely. That rope held. The fire department was good. Kept their word. But we don't do so well a lot of times. All of us have failed to trust God. And we'll probably fail to trust him again. I've had something for the last 19 years I've been trusting God on. And it's gotten more intense recently. And it's like, God, where are you? I've shook my fist at him a couple of times. We've had some words. And I think he's saying, trust me. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I have no clue. I'm just pointing out we're all in the boat together. And at times it seems like the boat is going down. But God's made us a promise. I got you. I got you. Can we trust him? Yes. Will we trust him? Let's pray. Father in heaven, What do we say? You're, you're our father. You're our dad. It's like you're the one standing out in the water of the pool and we're the little kids and you're saying, jump, I got you, jump, I got you. And we're that little kid that says, I don't know, daddy. I don't know if you got me or not. There's, there's no difference. But yet, there's times we don't trust you, Father. Help us in our lack of trust, just to put our faith, complete faith in you, and realizing it isn't always going to turn out the way that we want it, and we're going to be suffering at times, and we're going to be disappointed, but it's all for our good. It's all for our strength. It's all for making us more like Jesus. So, Father, wrap your arms around us, there's people in the congregation that's really hurting this morning. Wrap your arms around them and assure them it's going to be okay. You got it. We love you. Help us to trust you. In Jesus' name, we beg and pray. Amen. Thank you for watching the message. If we can help you in any way, we ask that you please contact us. Check us out on our website at roscopchurch.org. You can find the information there, how to contact us. We'd love to hear from you, 
talk with you, and help you in your walk with Jesus. Thank you once again for joining with us.